All right, what I'm going to cover today is uh, shop made vacuum systems. Uh, first question would be is why you need one. Uh, as most of you know, I do a fair amount of stuff with veneer. And one of the things that you need to do with veneer is glue it down to something solid so that you take a, you know, piece of veneer here. I think this is probably uh, six mil. And uh, you got to put that down on a sheet of plywood or MDF or something like that. And a vacuum press is uh, far better than uh, trying to stick a call on the thing and uh, get it stationary while you try to roll the car up on the thing to press it. <laughs> That's what I was trying previously and I found out that every time I tried it, unless I jacked the car up, <laughs> slid the thing underneath it, that the piece of material would move. And it wasn't where I wanted it when I got done. <laughs> okay, the, uh, the amount of force that you can get out of one of these systems is rather amazing. The, uh, at 30 inches of vacuum, which is you, you, know, you start pulling down various atmospheres, and you, you can get up to 1,700 pounds per square feet, you know, which is roughly equivalent to the weight of one wheel on a car. And uh, so that one ends up being pretty ideal for uh, coupling it to uh, a vacuum bag, such as what I've got on this other table over here. Um, of special interest is irregularly shaped objects. If you've got something with a curve to it, uh, such as a bow front on a dresser or some, some kind of a shape like that, uh, it's almost uh, a requirement to have a, a setup like that. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to use a lot of clamps, and you're going to get just really uh, really ingenious with coming up with a, a call to or a, a platen to put on each side of this curved object. Even though you're using a uh, a vacuum bag, you still need support for the underside of whatever that object is, like a, like an arch or something like that, otherwise you're going to crush it. At 1,700 pounds, it's perfectly capable of that happening. Okay, uh, also it's really good for uh, larger flat objects, like a 2x2 uh, like two two or 4x4 four four or even bigger. It's, you're only limited by your imagination there. Bagged the 2x6 workbench. Say again? I bagged the 2x6 workbench. Yeah, okay. Torsion box. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, for those of you who turn, you've probably heard the term vacuum chucking. I had uh, heard it, read about it, and so forth, and then uh, when I went over to Mike Pizza's shop, I got, got a chance to see vacuum chucking in action there, and that's, that's pretty slick. Take a you know large, large plate. Um, do some screw threads to screw it onto your uh, your headstock on the lathe. Then you put a, an adapter that goes into the end of the uh, motor assembly, and you actually pull a vacuum through the chuck of the lathe. That way you can take a, a bowl or something like that that. Already turned the inside of the thing and made, you know, made it just absolutely perfect. Maybe even got it finished. You could take and turn this thing over, put it on a uh, rubberized faceplate, and uh, pull this vacuum, and it, it's on there just as though you had chucked it. Just as though you grabbed the thing with, uh, you know, with cold jaws or Longworth jaws. Okay, uh, to give credit where credit's due, most of the material that I'm using in here I got from two sources, which is actually one source. Um, one is JoeWoodworker.com and the other is VeneerSupplies.com. They're both by the same, same guy, he's just got different uh, uh, resources on there. But if you're looking to understand veneer, how to work with veneer, how to do um, your own veneer press, for example. Uh, the J 
JoeWoodworker.com website, you can spend literally days on there reading about veneer and how to work with it, how to cut it, all that type of thing. Quite a quite a good resource. And uh, for kits and parts and tools and all that kind of thing, VeneerSupplies.com is a it's another good resource. Okay, the three primary types of systems. Uh, first is a Venturi system that uses compressed air through a through an orifice. I'll get into more detail on that in a minute. Another is a continuous run type system where you take a an electric uh, vacuum pump, uh, plug the thing in the wall, and with an attached hose, um, you just let the thing run as long as you need uh, need the force. And what I'm going to spend the most time on is a cycling electric <coughs> type of uh, pump, which is what I brought along to, to show you in a minute. <coughs> okay, the Venturi system uh, takes advantage of a, uh, of a phenomenon where if you take compressed air and put that through one end of a hourglass shape, and let it escape the other end, when it, on the far side of the neck bound, it actually creates a vacuum. And what you can do is tap off of there, hook that up to a vacuum bag, and you're actually drawing a vacuum. The same as though you had a pump hooked to the other end of it, you're just using the force of the compressed air escaping to do that. But it uses a fair amount of compressed air to accomplish this. Um, that is the concept. This is the actual portion of it as to how it works, except that the two images are opposite flow. You would hook up your compressed air to the to this fitting. Uh, this is a valve that when it switches, it allows compressed air to, to come through this uh, multi-orifice device here, and you're drawing a vacuum out of this port. Bob, you know how much CFM it take on a compressor to, to run that? Uh, five and a half. Five and a half? Yep. To get what? Uh, well, it, it draws when it's, when it's operating, in other words, when the MAC valve is engaged, it requires five and a half CFM. And that will handle well, what kind of vacuum flow? Um, well, you, it depends on the size of your bag. You just have to extract as much air, but then once you've done the, the initial evacuation of air, it usually doesn't require very much to maintain it after that. I think he's asking what, how much pressure can you develop with the How much vacuum? Well, that pressure inflow. Uh, the same amount as with an electric. Yeah, I mean, you, once you draw it down to you know 28 to 30 max. inches of mercury, you've got your maximum pressure then. At what cubic feet per minute? It, it basically stops. I mean, once you have, yeah, once you have pulled that... <laughs> as you're pulling it down, how fast or how much will it evacuate? <clears throat> It'll evacuate the air at, at five and a half cubic feet a minute. So if you've got a bag there that is, uh, you know, maybe got two cubic feet of air in there, it'll take uh, maybe 30 <laughs> seconds to pull it down. <coughs> but then once that's you've got that's it pulled, specific Venturi. Say again? That specific Venturi. Yeah, this particular one is capable of pulling five and a half. So if you put a 100 psi of air on that thing, it would probably take about 30 seconds to uh, to evacuate one of those bags. It would go to what, 27, 28? It would go to 28, yeah. And, and then, it sells uh, for what? Say again? The Venturi package right. sells for what? Uh, I think I get into that in the next page. I don't recall what the figure was. <coughs> Bob, um, a more basic question. What size compressor would you need to do that? Um, probably about one horse. Okay. So relatively small one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't require You're a real You're talking base. 5 CFM continuous? No. Well, it's, it's, you need 5 CFM to evacuate your bag for as long as, you know, for as many cubic feet as it's in the bag. But then you, you only need to... <coughs> 
Oh, yeah. I'm assuming that, that you're going to hook the thing up in a cycling fashion. And the switch turns it on and off, right? Yeah, you got to switch. That mech valve there switches it on and off depending on the need. Once you felt your vacuum. Yeah, if you, don't, if you don't have any leaks in your system or negligible leaks, uh, the thing might cycle you know, a couple of times a day. So you only need, you only need a large uh, volume of air. So that's initially. actually works as a shutoff valve. After it evacuates everything out, gets it down to a certain point, yeah. it shouldn't let anything back yeah, in. What you, what you don't see on there right now is a, is a called a vacuum switch that will cover in a minute. Okay, as far as the cost <coughs> on, uh, on the Venturi type systems, it does require a compressor. Um, you know, maybe something with a well, 15 gallon tank or something like that and about a one horse motor. Uh, assuming that you have that already, it is cheaper and lighter than a, an electric version. The kit that uh, is required to, to you know, provide all the plumbing and the brass and uh, the back valve and the switches, all that kind of thing, is about $235. It is uh, probably faster than uh, most of the rest of the things, but it does require that you be tethered to a compressor, so you can't be any further away than the hose on your compressor will let you be. Yeah, the 5.5 CFM is vacuum flow at atmospheric pressure? Yes. Yep. Okay, now we move into the uh, continuous run tank unit. That's what a continuous run unit would look like. The, <coughs> the one on your left would be a 1 CFM unit, which holds one, one cubic foot of air. It's suitable for a, a small bag, and if you're patient, it'll, uh, with a larger bag, it'll just take longer. Bob, there's one on the floor right there by the thing. Okay. Yeah, Hans, Hans brought one along. No, I'm saying we'll the loader is on the, the pump is on the floor too. Okay. Just the pump. Well, uh, we'll talk, talk more about that when I get over to that side there. The, uh, the other type of unit that's available is a 5.5 uh, CFM motor. Same principle of the thing, it's just that it uh, requires a bigger, bigger pump. You can evacuate more air faster. But the, uh, the downside of uh, a system like that is the thing runs all the time, all the time that you need force. If you like listening to a vacuum pump run with its boogie to boogie boogie to noise, <laughs> then uh, knock yourself out. The uh, story behind that is uh, Jane Burke you know, had a, uh, she had been using just you know, various types of clamp pressure, you know, weights and various kinds of things to do her stuff. And uh, she came upon a pump similar to this at uh, some sort of a sale that they had down at Emory University, I think it was. They were cleaning out some laboratory. And she came up with this thing. It was, I'd never seen a pump quite like it. And it was really fast. And she was just busily using that thing. Uh, you know, out of your shop. Turbine pump? Was that what it, it was? It could have been. Yeah. I never did figure out, you know, what the principle of the thing was. Never saw a nameplate on it or anything like that. You hooked up to 110 and <coughs> it, would, uh, it would evacuate that big bag there in just seconds. But uh, the only thing was, I said, you know, hey, it, uh, <coughs> It would behoove you for such a nice machine like that. Let's hook it up to a uh, set of controls and so forth and make it cycle so that the, uh, the pump will last. Those are designed for continuous evacuation of chemical hoods and stuff like that. Most are they? Likely. Yeah. Okay. You know, the I don't know how many biochemical hoods that they have. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many years, you know, what the life cycle is on something like that, but I. Probably quite extensive. Really? Designed for continuous use. Okay. If that's what it wants. Yeah. Okay. As far as cost on a continuous run unit like that, uh, the smaller unit that you saw, you know, with the pump and the fittings and the hose and all that kind of thing, it would be about 300. 
The uh, bigger version would be about 400. And as I indicated, it runs uh, for as long as force is required. And now we get into the uh, cycling electric, or uh, I'm not sure what the, I think it's electric vacuum system is what the acronym stands for there. That looks like a, uh, you know, to those of you in the audience, it looks like a fairly complicated device sitting there with lots of, lots of wires and hose and all that kind of thing. But what, uh, what I'll show you in a minute is uh, a straight line schematic of how the thing works. The advantages of the the EVS type system is it's it's pretty portable. As long as you don't make the thing heavy enough, you can't relocate it or get it off the ground. Uh, it is a standalone device that only requires electric, and you build the thing from a kit that you can get the kit at. Uh, at uh, the nearsupplies.com website that I showed you. There's basically what you get in the kit for $157. Uh, when uh, I was approaching Jane on adapting her her pump to a, uh, a cycling version, you know, she wanted to go down to Home Depot and pick up all that brass and so forth. So well, it's going to take you about a day and a half to you know stand there in front of that bin get all those brass parts, and then uh, probably about two or three more trips down there to get the stuff that you left. That price doesn't include the pump itself, does it? Uh, no, not for that price. No. You've got a good straight man, though, because that's the next slide. Bob, <laughs> yeah. well, this is a, a technical question, related, maybe not related, but what is the difference in the brass fitting and the steel fitting? Especially when you consider the cost, it's a significant cost. Isn't significant it? cost difference, yeah. Oh, but, you know, why brass? Brass, mm -hmm. brass doesn't spark. Green. Huh? Brass doesn't spark. Oh, okay, now, okay, that, that, that's good enough. Yeah, a number, number of different things. It's more resistant to elements. Well, that makes better elements, sense. It you know, doesn't corrosion, spark. rust, uh, you know, things like that. Doesn't rust, of course. But okay, yeah. that, that has good enough. Functionally, they're both equivalent. But there's uh, less bad stuff that can happen to brass than there is to steel. You know, the, the elements are less likely to interfere with it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, as far as the schematic, uh, all that, that earlier slide that you saw there with all those wires and tubes and so forth, it's, uh, it's a lot more straightforward than uh, the one that the first diagram showed. When you uh, stretch all the stuff out in a straight line, this is what you wind up with, you know, minus the wiring that would uh, attach to the motor, the back valve, and that vacuum controller. Are you going to tell us what a back valve is somewhere? Yep. Okay, as far as the, uh, the airflow, we'll take this thing in stages to show you uh, how one of these things works. The Objective is that you you would attach your airbag out here with some type of a connector. You would then begin extracting air from there through a uh, gate valve or a ball valve rather, and you have these reservoirs with a system like this that holds your, your basically your storage. You know, it's kind of like a battery. You know, where you store vacuum. Then it would, uh, it would pull it through and then uh, to replenish the air in these reservoirs, you have your pump on the other end that only runs when you need it. Now to cover this in stages... <coughs> uh, Bob, why do you want to store the vacuum? Uh, I'm going to show you. Okay. Okay, the... Uh, to cover this thing in stages, once the system is charged, you know, in other words, you've had, the, you've had the pump running long enough to store the vacuum in these reservoirs, assuming the, uh, the ball valve is closed, uh, this check valve keeps you from drawing more atmosphere. In other words, this valve becomes a storage device. 
for your vacuum. So you've got uh, you know x number of cubic feet of uh, vacuum stored in these reservoirs. The intent being that when you hook this thing up to a vacuum bag and you switch that manual valve. Oh, and before I before I forget about it, this vacuum controller up here is sensing the amount of vacuum in this system. So if you've got this thing pulled down to you know 28 inches of mercury. You know, which is near, you know, pretty near absolute vacuum, then uh, the vacuum controller tells the pump to quit running. At that point, the system is fully charged, you know, kind of like a battery being fully charged. It's just waiting on some type of drain. So the, uh, when you turn the vacuum valve on, then the, the reason for these reservoirs becomes apparent. Because uh, the idea is that when you've got glue that's got a, a pot life of uh, you know 10 or 15 minutes, you're usually in pretty much of a hurry. Once you get that glue on there, you want to get it under pressure so that you can try to get as much air out of there as possible. So the the idea is for these reservoirs to evacuate that bag as quickly as possible. So that's where this becomes important. So it will begin doing that. The pump won't start until these things reaches uh, probably you know six or seven inches of mercury. Then the uh, then the vacuum switch decides that oh wait a minute I need more need more air or more vacuum. So it will switch on and cause the pump to switch on <coughs> to uh, suck more air out of these reservoirs. Is there any uh, moisture content with vacuum air as compared with the moisture content of compressed air? Well, because you're <laughs> because the compressed air is actually exiting and going into the atmosphere. So it, the moisture is going with it. the moisture out. Right. Okay. Once uh, once you reach the condition where you need more vacuum. What winds up happening now is that that switch that I showed you before, it causes the, the pump to turn on. At the same time, it closes this, this MAC valve. I'll, uh, I'll show you the purpose of that in a moment as we, uh, as we get near the end. Basically, the, uh, the MAC valve switches this whole thing such that with the motor off, uh, everything reaches atmospheric pressure on this side. When you turn the motor on, you need to reverse that condition. That's what a MAC valve does for you. The, uh, the purpose of this head reservoir, which is just a small reservoir, is so that the pump does not see a large load when it starts up. You know, it's much like a starting capacitor on a motor. You know, except you still have a starting capacitor here, but uh, like on a, on a car compressor for air conditioner or something like that, there's a large amount of strain <coughs> on a uh, compressor to, uh, to start the thing under load. So this is an attempt to reduce the load. So what happens is once the system is balanced, it's fully charged and so forth, this thing here switches to relieve the, the vacuum out of this container so that it now reaches atmospheric pressure. The check valve keeps you from bleeding off the vacuum that you have stored. So as soon as you uh, engage the system, the motor starts, the back valve switches. You then, first off, because the check valve is still closed, uh, the motor is now drawing a vacuum in this small reservoir. Uh, once that thing reaches uh, switching vacuum, in other words, it has uh, sucked all the air out of, that, out of that small reservoir, it then engages the check valve. The check valve then releases to begin sucking air out of, the, out of your big reservoirs.
Okay, now we'll get into the cost of these things. Um, the brass kit for a cycling system like this is a little more expensive. It's uh, 157. The uh, 5.5 CFM pump by itself is about 30 for a total of uh, about 490. And on top of that, you might need a few PVC parts and a few other a few other accessories. Then uh, most of the systems are going to need some type of a uh, vacuum bag. Uh, what I have found a preference for is a, a 30 mil polypropylene vinyl. Uh, I took a look at uh, the possibility of making my own, but then by the time I looked at all the all the stuff that you had to do, there wasn't all that much of a savings in uh, going ahead and buying a ready-made bag from uh, Joe Woodworker because that uh, that came, we'll, we'll cover these in a moment, but that came, you know, welds on three sides and the air fitting already included. Uh, a four by four bag, uh, which is like the one on the far side over there, runs about a hundred bucks where you could get the vinyl from him to do the uh, do a do-it-yourself job. You get a big sheet of vinyl there for about 70 bucks. Then uh, once you get done putting all this stuff together, you wind up with a finished project that looks about like that. Uh, when I built mine, I decided that uh, you know there were a number of different factors involved there. I wanted to keep all the wiring contained so that uh, either myself or anybody working with this thing wouldn't juice themselves. And uh, also wanted the, uh, the pump self-contained so that you know, any moving parts and so forth would be fully shielded. And I designed the carrier on the thing such that the, the wood or the carrier itself would protect all the, all the vital parts so that you wouldn't wind up snapping something off. And then uh, for the other side of the thing, I came up with a hose storage thing. I think at the time I uh, probably, I, I'm not even sure if I had a scroll saw at the time, so I went over to George's and had him uh, help me with uh, cutting out some parts there to make, uh, make a uh, Securing mechanism there to hold the tanks in place so that they wouldn't wobble around. But the fun part of this project mm -hmm. is uh, once you've got that straight line diagram there that I showed you, that schematic, the rest of it is all in the packaging. It makes the tanks bigger, smaller, <coughs> make it vertical, vertical, horizontal, you know, kind of like it's up to your imagination at that point. These are a few pictures of. Uh, some systems that I got off of uh, Joe Woodworker's site. There's one where uh, the guy went just really exotic and uh, came up with some sort of exotic paint job on the on the system. Then here's one where the guy just went really crazy with the paint job. <laughs> and believe it or not, that is a vacuum pump. The, the pump itself is up in the top of that unit. But he, he just went crazy with the paint job on his on his storage tanks there. And if something like that you can store it in the living room and nobody would notice. He's <laughs> just calling his artwork. <laughs> and then uh, you've got other other packaging there. I thought this one was pretty slick. Um, primarily because it uses a uh, compressor, uh, one of those portable air storage tanks. Uh, I bought one just recently down at um, Northern Tool. I think it was about 40 or $45. Uh, boy, that, uh, that would save, uh, save a lot of effort and energy and so forth trying to, trying to find the proper size uh, parts and so forth to do it out of PVC. And you don't even have to glue anything. So I thought if I had to do it again, I'd probably uh, probably use one of those air storage tanks. 
need to have uh, one or two of them, put it on a put it on a hen truck. But you'd be able to uh, suck a lot of vacuum in a hurry with that. Does so the size, that, the size of the, does the size of the storage tank help you in the amount of time it takes to evacuate the air? Exactly. So the bigger the storage tank, the faster it goes? Yes. Just to turn the projector off, Bob. Bob. Yes, sir. You want to turn the projector off? Uh, yeah. yeah. I forget uh, what button you got to press there. Power mm -hmm. the other side. Okay. Right. Press the other one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's telling you what to press there now. Hey, Jim. Press it again. It's prompting you up here. Oh, oh. Okay, this is the. Uh, the system that I built. Um, since Hans asked a question, we'll cover the uh, the tank sizes there. This uh, this particular storage tank here uh, needs to remain on the small side. It only needs to be big enough for the compressor to spin up the speed uh, to start to begin uh, drawing a vacuum. If you go making this thing very big. The compressor is going to run quite a quite a long time before it begins doing the work that you're interested in having it do. The uh, the other tanks. Oh, I just you, you put your laptop right there. Sure. The yep. The other tanks that are here uh, are just arbitrary. You want them, you know, big enough that that your pump is not cycling all too frequently. I just decided that okay, the form factor of this thing looked about right, so I would uh, stack up two two tanks, one on top of the other, and make it about that long. If I were to do it over again, I would probably make the tanks, you know, a, a bit longer and put them vertical, and probably put them on a hand truck, you know, because. Try to pick this thing up, up, up and carry it somewhere. You know, as you uh, as you start accumulating a few years on your age, it gets a little tougher and tougher. <laughs> so I am uh, becoming a real fan of things on wheels. On a four on a four by four bag, how often does that turn back on? With what you said. Uh, for the project we're going to do for this afternoon. Uh, what I did is I wound up using both bags, and that is one of the modifications that I made to this thing from the pictures that I took. Here's uh, a second hose that I put on there so I could operate two bags at once. But what I did is uh, on the pieces that uh, are over there, I put uh, six items in that big bag, and when I turned the, turned the system on, the pump uh, pulled down to you know about 28 inches of mercury. Pulled it down in less than a minute, and then uh, the pump didn't turn back on again for I think it was almost eight hours. Yeah, you know, the uh, the seal is the the really important part, the bag seal. Um, Okay, let's talk about some of the uh, some of the other things here. Some of the some of the features that I stuck on this thing that uh, I have changed over time. We already talked about the addition of a second hose. All that involved with the second uh, um, ball valve. I stuck a uh, a pilot light on top of my control box so that I could tell that it was plugged into power. Uh, that turned out to be uh, vitally important when I carried the thing over to some classes and so forth that we did, people were uh, deciding that, well, this thing isn't running right now, so we'll pull the cord and go over here and use it on this on this scroll saw. <laughs> and I looked over there and I thought, well, if we're going to need to pull a vacuum again, <laughs> we need power. Okay, uh, the other thing that I did too is the hose that uh, Joe Woodworker supplies is a really soft vinyl hose that after Oh, a year or so of usage, 
that uh, that hose that its sole purpose is to hook up to this vacuum switch, that hose collapsed. So uh, I thought, well, you know, let's put a piece of copper on there. Well, I had I had a terrible time trying to get that that thing to seal. You know, with all the, the bends and perturbations I had to do there. So uh, I wound up using a piece of automotive vacuum hose. I figured, well, if it works good for pulling a vacuum on a car, and it, you know, that thing lasts for many, many, many years. So that has worked well. Just had a couple of barn fitting changes there. Um, another significant change that made my life considerably easier was uh, I added a uh, muffler on the end of the vacuum pump. That quieted this thing down a lot. I mean, all it is is a little, little tiny thing. I think it cost about two bucks, but it sure made uh, life around the house there considerably better because the wife didn't have to listen to the, the air rushing out of that thing. <laughs> Did it slow it down any? No. Hmm. All it does is muffle the noise. Well. You know, air make, <clears throat> moving air makes a lot of noise. <laughs> Anything you can do to try to quiet it down a little bit, stick a you know, little bit of foam or insulation or something like that in there to, to uh, you know, keep the noise from escaping, makes life pretty easy. You added that gauge too, didn't you? No, the gauge comes with that kit. That's uh, that's pretty important. You can, uh, when you first turn the thing on, and you're you're concerned about leaks, you know, as to whether the thing's going to be able to pull a vacuum and keep it there. You can watch the performance of that gauge there. When that thing continues to sweep down, it starts slowing down as it, you know, gets close to 28 or 28, 29 inches of mercury. Then, uh, then you realize, oh, I must have a pretty good seal. And then when the pump shuts off, I'll stand there and watch the thing for, you know, a couple of minutes and see if it's creeping back up again. If it if it stays stationary, then chances are you've got a good seal on your bag. Excuse me. Yeah. Is this this is a pump nut venturi effect, right? Correct. So uh, I haven't worked one for so many years. And is it cheaper to go with a pump than with the venturi? Do you know? Venturi is going to be cheaper because you don't, the Venturi type relies on your compressor. Yeah. So therefore you don't need another pump. I mean, you've already got a perfectly good pump on your compressor. So if you've got a 60 gallon compressor or something like that, the Venturi's. Okay, because that's what I'm familiar with when I hadn't worked with the pumps. So I was just. Okay. Uh, how long do you put things in the bag typically? 24 hours? Um, oh, I usually find six to eight hours is, okay. is more than sufficient. Yeah. Doesn't that depend on what glue you're using? Uh, well, I use a, a PVA type most of the time. The idea is you want the you want the glue to uh, you, you got to suck all the moisture out of the glue, which the the pump by itself is not allow to it. The only thing uh, you're restricted by is the the size of the piece that you're doing. So usually uh, uh, two hours, two to three hours is sufficient for a small piece at, at atmospheric pressure. But when you do it a large piece, you know, under pressure, that that glue that's in the center is not going to uh, not going to have the, the moisture sucked out of it very fast. So that's why you need the additional time. Yes, sir. Somebody likes to use too much glue too many times. <laughs> yeah. Do you have to worry about the, the glue squeezing out and getting onto the plastic and sort of drying the uh, stuff there? Do you have to cover you it up? You want to be kind of frugal <coughs> with your use of glue. I'm good at that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Rob, Rob would have a tough time. I've seen the way he uses glue. He likes glue. And this is mainly, you're using it for marketry and stuff like that, but if you were making. Uh, like cutting boards or something like that, where you're assembling parts together. Would you use that for the same way? Would you? Would you are you better off just clamping something like that? Um, well, there's two, there's two answers. Yeah, there's like two there. answers to that. If you're uh, if you're taking blocks of wood and gluing them side to side, yeah. a uh, a vacuum system like this isn't going to 
be That's a what I was really thinking it's to go down that you know, more of the traditional clamps, you know, edge clamps and so forth would uh, would be the answer there. Okay. But the the second part of that answer is I have made cutting boards, you know, custom cutting boards for customers where uh, they wanted the thing it wasn't so much a cutting board, it looked like a cutting board, but it's actually a serving board where you use some of these god awful expensive woods that it only makes sense to use in a veneer. Yeah. But I made uh, several serving boards using olive wood. And uh, what I did is I used those on a uh, uh, Baltic birch uh, substrate. And yes, I did use, I did glue that up. Yeah. You know, again, I, I reverted back to veneer. Yeah, mainly for putting like, veneers and stuff on. Yeah. yeah. And it's common to use, but there's a lot of others. Let's say you're going to glue something the size of that tabletop, which is what, 28 by 60? You got any clamps that'll reach the middle? Yes. <laughs> I love clamps. <laughs> you, you got clamps with 18 inch throats? He's, he's got he's got some heavy duty clamps in the shop. Uh, some of them are provided. Clamps and wedges. No, when, when we do have a thing like what you're saying, what we have bought is some uh, square tubing bars that we go all the way through and clamp it on the sides so it holds all the way across the <coughs> point. But I do have a couple that are. But how do you deep. figure the deflection in that bar? You know, you're getting the same pressure in the middle that you're on the edges. And there's still. Or they they're, move. They're heavy movement. They could bend a little bit, but yeah. not, not much. Where this will, if, if the vacuum will be equal pressure all the yeah. way across the piece. Uh, I used to make it uh, big, but make right. a torsion box uh, workbenches or torsion box. Big. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, you had a question. Yeah, let me ask you something. Have you ever seen anybody <laughs> take when they like when they put their piece in the vacuum bag? and lay a piece of material over the top of it, say like a, a, a bag that oranges or something or onions would come in and lay a piece of that in there and that would give you a slight channel to pull vacuum so oh, yeah I'll cover, I'll cover that in a minute. Okay. Yeah, you, make a, you make a good straight man there. <laughs> yes, if you buy a kit, a Venturi kit to hook up to a compressor. Yep. You turn the compressor on and it pulls a vacuum. Do you manually turn the compressor off or does the kit turn it off? Uh, the kit turns it off and the thing that, that causes it to turn off is the vacuum switch. Okay, and so then if there's a subsequent leak, does the kit turn the compressor back on? Yes. Okay. Well, well, I'll take it back. Uh, you're, you're almost right there. The, you've got two separate machine. control systems working there. The, the compressor is going to run when it needs to replace the air in its tank, in its own tank. Uh, you then have a separate control system that is the the vacuum controls to control when your when your bag needs replacement. But I, air. I I could leave the room and it would automatically do what. Yes. Yeah. Both systems are going to run independently and, and they will behave. They play nice together. Okay. I saw a hand wave over here somewhere. I thought. Okay. All right. I'll go ahead and. Uh, this thing up in such a way as we can make it work here. charged uh, previously so uh, the only thing that we were doing there was uh, replacing whatever had leaked through the fittings and uh, last time I had turned this pump on was um, I think yesterday afternoon when I set up okay the way uh, the way you go about using one of these things this is a uh, an air chuck that comes with part of that kit 
that attaches to one of these uh, tire valve kind of uh, attachments on the bag. It's a tire valve without the, uh, the spring-loaded uh, stop in there. So this, uh, this seals it off quite well. <coughs> the only part that I've had to replace in this whole system here has been this piece here primarily because of the rubber seal that's on the inside. You know, might have been able to find the rubber seal somewhere, but uh, when that part only costs about five or six dollars, I figure why, why knock myself out trying to find it. The, uh, what they recommend doing with the, uh, these vacuum bags is you will need some type of what they call a platen, which is what this piece of melamine is on the inside. Uh, now a solid sheet of melamine, when you go applying vacuum to the top of it like this, the vacuum is going to do a, you know, a very good job of sucking this valve down to the melamine. The rest of the air is going to stay in the bag, but the pump's happy. You know, it shuts off. <laughs> so that's why you need to make uh, tiny slices in the melamine so that you can pull, pull vacuum across the entire surface. Uh, the, the one precaution that you have to use though is if you're, whatever piece you put in there, uh, you need to have another uh, platen of some sort, you know, such as on this, this glue up that I'm about to do here. Uh, this piece here would be the, the platen itself uh, because I'm only gluing one side of this thing at a time of, of this part. The, uh, the part that I'm gluing is on the inside so this effectively becomes a platen here. So what you do is you put this on the, on the inside of the bag. If you're trying to flatten a big piece of veneer for example, you would probably want to do that against a, uh, a solid surface. So you would turn this uh, this platen with the cuts in it. You would turn it over. And to answer Tommy's question there about uh, <coughs> some type of other material, this is a material that uh, Joe Woodworker calls it micro mesh, but it's a uh, it's basically a big heavy net that uh, you put that on the inside and this allows the, the vacuum to be able to reach all the, uh, all the surfaces. If I did it without it, uh, what would wind up happening is you'd be, you'd be drawing a vacuum against that piece of MDF and it would shut off you know, as you got close to the uh, evacuating the air in the bag. You would wind up shutting off the, the vacuum source. You got one on both sides, Bob? Uh, of the uh, the mesh, you mean? Yes. No. He's got the slots on the board on the other side. So I just leave the uh, leave the micro mesh stored inside the bag, so I keep all the parts together. Uh, orientation doesn't really matter much. This is the. Uh, clamp that comes with the bag when you get it. A lot of people have made a lot of discussion about uh, uh, making these things out of uh, various sizes of PVC. <coughs> I was glad to see that uh, Joe Woodworker decided to uh, make these things available with the bag. There's some, some air in there also, you know, fair amount. Don't really need to worry about that. 
One of the things that I would heartily recommend when you close this clamp, leave a little bit of the, uh, the blue portion of the clamp exposed so you can get a finger or fingernail or something like that in there to remove the clamp when you're done. I watched uh, Paul Search using one of, one of my bags here at a uh, class that I went to with him and uh, he wound up uh, extracting one of his fingernails trying to get this clamp mm -hmm. off. Oh, it was, it was painful. <laughs> Okay, once you've got the uh, clamp on there, you're ready to uh, ready to get down to business. You just switch the valve. You'll notice the, uh, the bag pulling down, and you'll see the gauge starting to move. Okay, the uh, gauge is reading about 28 inches of mercury there. You got a question? Yeah, uh, the grooves in the board, I need some cut in. They're about an eighth of an inch. Yeah. Uh, Somewhere. Square. Exactly. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. You can take the surface off. There's a bunch of curse in there and you can throw it together. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be precise. Yeah, Paul, Paul does it with a circular saw. I, yeah, I come from the Ken Vickery School of Woodworking, so I use a fence and a table saw. <laughs> Measure each cut. <laughs> and, uh, one of the <laughs> yeah. Make sure the thing's accurate down to the 64th, you know. There's yes, sir. One thing on your board that you cut off your roof and everything in, would it be uh, a little bit easier on the bag if you rounded those edges off? So Absolutely, yep. With a router around those. Even a file helps. Uh, that's what I did with these things. I went over just with a regular flat file, it's just to uh, edge, just know. to break those sharp edges. One of the pieces that I wound up putting in this big bag, uh, somewhere along the line, you will notice a patch over here in this corner. That's where I actually uh, pierced the bag with the uh, with one of the uh, flattens. And you want to round up the edge of the flat too? Yes, you do. You make a good straight man there, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, for the platens that you use regularly, you do want to treat the edges on those things, you know, round those over. Um, what I did here is the, the substrate that I used, that I applied the veneer to, I cut the platen about a, uh, oh, maybe an eighth to a quarter of an inch bigger. Than the uh, than the actual substrate, so that when the when the bag draws the vacuum, it doesn't wind up snapping off the piece of veneer that is overhanging the edge. Then after you get the thing out of the bag, you uh, you separate the whole thing and you trim off that excess veneer around the edge, either with a, a router or you know whatever your favorite uh, tool is. Yes. If you buy the uh and jury can be used with a compressor. Do you need to also build a vacuum storage tank to keep no. the compressor from cycling on and off? No, you got a you got a great big uh, storage tank with yeah. that uh, compressor. compressor tank. That then becomes your storage tank <clears throat> to keep your compressor from cycling on and off. No, but you're still going to have air going through the venturi the whole time, aren't you? No. 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 That's the only time the air is going through the venturi is when you're trying to replace any kind of leakage that occurred in your bag. You'll notice as we pull this down, that gauge hasn't moved yet. The same, same exact thing would happen with a venturi system. And you could, you could use either kind of system with a bag or with a vacuum chuck on a blade. Just yes, yep, absolutely. They're pretty much interchangeable. If you've got, you've got ready access to a, uh, to a decent compressor, like a, you know, anywhere from a 25-gallon tank to a 60-gallon tank, and you're willing to operate within the reaches of that uh, compressor system, 
then you're in. You could probably get by with less, it's just going to run a little more frequently. Because the, the, the storage tank on the compressor then becomes your accumulator. So it's it's equivalent to these tanks that I've got here. Yeah, but that's nowhere near 25 No, it's nowhere near 25 <laughs> gallon, but if you know, depending on what your requirements are. Most most one or two horsepower compressors are basically that size. Yeah. The storage tank on your compressor is going to compress the air in it. That's got vacuum in it. Yes. Same concept. It's same concept. It's the storage. Yeah, but it, you know, you, you, you're talking about using the Ventura. You've got, you've got the tank on your compressor for supplying an air pressure to draw the vacuum to that Ventura. Yes. When, when the vacuum in your bag, when you, when you get your vacuum down, where, where's the valve to maintain that pressure in the, in the bag? It's going to be a check valve between your bag and the, and the yes. vacuum inlet on the venture. It's going to be a check valve. That's just going to It'll be, yeah, keep, so. keep the, the atmospheric pressure from bleeding back in through there. How how is that going to? Where, where where's the valve that controls where the air is going through the venture to the venture? That's, that's what the, the back valve, valve is. What the, the Mac valve becomes the, the switch that switches air into the venture. Okay, turns your compressor on and off. It's about like using one of those uh, air nozzles, mm -hmm. so that when the when the bag needs air, that uh, that Mac valve is the same thing as pressing one of those one of those levers on an air chuck. But how's the Mac valve you know, sensing the pressure in the vacuum in the bag? Well, the, the two key things that you might be missing there is the the vacuum switch that is sensing. The air or the absence thereof. Well, I, I didn't see all that in you when you showed the Venturi up there. I didn't see all those other things in the yeah. drawing. Yeah, right. I, I didn't. I didn't expand that the way I did with the EVS system. But so you still two, got all the, the same components. You got the same components. You got the same components. You don't have the pump without the pump. You can still have the pump. You got a Venturi. Yeah. Yep. So you still got all the, all the other other same components there. Right. Okay. Well, but you still need the storage tanks to store the uh, to store the vacuum. No, you don't need storage tanks. It's pressure. Your pressure you're, tank is your pressure. storage tank. Well, but that, that is your... That, no, the, the compressor is not storing your vacuum. The compressor is storing the air pressure. Right? Yeah, but right. air pressure is what operates the vacuum. Yes, but you've got to have air flowing through that Venturi to not all the to time. The vacuum. Oh, so so you've still got to have on. some sort of a vacuum storage, not just no, the bag. No, no, no. Okay. okay. You don't need it on this hill. <laughs> Once the system sealed and it's pumped it's down, you don't need it on this. You're not supplying really. any air you know, until the, the pressure in that system drops. And then the uh, it uses a reservoir make, on your air compressor. Make feel better. If, if he wants vacuum pumps, that'll just make your air compressor run less frequently. That's all. Yeah. You you could you could build a system using tanks like this, hooked up to a compressor. The only thing the only thing you're removing out of the equation is the the vacuum pump right. itself. I understand that. You you could take the take that pump off and put a venturi in there and place it. <coughs> yes. You still need that vacuum storage tank to, to maintain the You don't need to, but it no. it requires the, the vacuum storage just gives you a quick drawdown from atmosphere quick to fairly well low it's, it's it, any leakage in here it, it's it's continuing it, it can it can suck it into that tank Same if you yes, evacuate the bag. Your storage tank is your right. source of energy. So you see, all the pump is the source of energy here. Yeah, but your I've got, I've got, I've got the vacuum, the, the tanks here to maintain my vacuum. Just think of, just think of your storage tank where it's vacuum or it's pressure as an energy reservoir, right. and yeah. that's all it is. So when the system needs some energy, it's going to take it out of either that tank or that tank. Potential, One of the two. Potential it's, energy reservoir. Yeah. It, it's an accumulator. This is an accumulator of vacuum. I'm still not convinced, but I'll work. I'll think what he's worried about is with the Venturi. I've used, I've used both. The main reason I went through this one over the compressor tank is the time that I built this, I had a little tiny hot dog compressor. I knew that was going to be enough for a Did you try it with that, or did you just assume that it would be? Uh, I tried it over at uh, Don Russell's. You get a little box. All he's got is a he's got a big overgrown hot dog compressor, and it runs pretty frequently. It'll get it'll get the job done, but the compressor is going to run maybe once an hour.